So next we need to build the attack animation for our character, which is going to include making the animation itself, making sure that the animator can play that animation when we have an attack triggering event actually happen in our game. And we'll be creating a state machine behavior script, which is a special script that attaches to not a player game object, but rather the animation state itself and the animator. So if we take a look at the animator, any animation state can have a behavior added in. And that's what the state machine behaviors are referring to. So we'll be creating a force lock behavior, which will make it so that when we're in an attacking state, the player will not be able to move its character around. So the first thing we need to do, of course, like with every other animation, is to create the animation clip in the animation component. So jump into the player prefab, open up animation, and then click on the drop down and create a new clip. We're going to create it in characters player. I'm going to call this player attack one. So the reason this one has a one attached to it is that eventually we'll have a sequence of three animations where we can have three separate attacks in sequence, which will have a sword swing and then two more sword swings to follow it up. So player attack one is the animation name. Save it. And I'll change the samples to 10. Now let's find in our RV Ross Adventurer pack the animations we want to use. So I scroll up to where we have attack one and I'm going to select all of the animations that have that name. So that's attack one zero zero to attack 104, so five frames, put that in there, hit play, and then we can see our animation play. So I do want to note that this animation is not gonna loop, so I'm gonna click on characters player, and we're gonna take that animation, go to the inspector, and turn off loop time. Now we need to jump into the animator, go back to the base layer, and we're going to take this player attack one and move it into a new substate machine. So I'm going to right click copy it and then on the graph I'm going to right click create substate machine. Click on the substate machine, go to the inspector and let's call this ground attack. I'll delete player attack one from the graph, go into ground attack and control V to paste the copied clip in. So with this ground attack substate machine, we're only going to be able to transition to it if we're from the ground state. Otherwise, we would have an air attack. So ground states is going to be able to transition to ground attack when our attack trigger is set. So I'm going to right click on ground states, make transition, ground attack. And let's go straight into the ground attack state machine. So I'm going to right click on ground states, make transition into ground attack. And let's choose state machine, ground attack. So we'll let the state machine figure out what the default state should be. And then ground attack can make a transition back to ground states, state machine, ground states. This won't have any requirements. We simply need to have some exit from ground attack and we'll automatically go back to ground states. So now to create the trigger from ground states to ground attack, let's click on add trigger. And I will call this the attack trigger, all lowercase. And we'll add that as a condition. So let's go up to attack true. Now I also want to be able to exit the ground state when attack is made. So I'm going to double click into ground states and let's add a new transition from player idle, player run and player walk towards the exit. So right click make transition for each of these, then click on the stack of transitions, add the condition, do attack, turn off has exit time, set the transition duration to zero and do that for each of them. So attack has exit time, transition duration zero and attack as the trigger. So let's go back out to our main scene and we'll see the player input component once again. We'll need to create that attack trigger if one doesn't already exist. But if we take a look at events and player, you'll see that I already set up attack at the beginning of our uh, tutorial. So let's go to actions and double click import player actions and make sure that you have an attack or fire action, whatever you want to call it. You just need a attack button to use. In this case, the default button, let's see, is left mouse. So that's what we'll be pressing in order to make our sword swing. Feel free to change it to any key you want. Now we need to create the function and add it to our attack event. So I'm going to open up player controller, add it script. Let's go down to the bottom and add in public void on attack import action dot callback context context. So we'll do if context started. We don't need to check for ground because the same trigger will be used for air attacks as well. And we'll do animator dot set trigger and let's say animation strings dot attack. So now we just need to generate that field, right click, go to definition equals, and then I'm gonna type in the string name of attack here. So that'll be our attack trigger string. Now, if we want to be more specific about what these strings are being used for, we could rename it across our project to be jump trigger and jump attack. I think that's gonna make some sense here. So I'm going to right click and do rename and then I'm going to change it to jump trigger and hit apply. I'm going to right click on attack 
and then do rename attack trigger and hit apply. And with this method of refactoring, wherever we had the string referenced, it's just going to update the variable name here. But the string that it's pointing to here remains the same. So we don't need to update our animator controller. So now that we have the function created, go back out to the main scene and we need to add it to our player input events. Going to make sure to do that in the prefab and then click on events, player, add one for attack. Let's drag the player game object here and then select the script. So player controller on attack. And now that's linked up. So let's exit the prefab, hit play on the scene and see if we can get left click to trigger our attack. So left click and there's our animation. Now you can see that after the animation is done, it just freezes in place. It should be exiting the state. So let's exit the play mode, go to the base layer, go into ground attack and then player attack one. I'm going to right click, make a transition to the exit. Click on the transition. This is going to have an exit time and it's going to be at exit time is one which means that when the attack animation is done, transition duration zero. So if we attack and we haven't attacked again to move into player attack two or player attack three state, then at the end of this attack animation, there's no further import. So we just return to our main ground state loop. Later on, we'll have player attack two, which if we have the trigger set again, we can jump into that and then return if we click no further buttons. But this should be good for now. So let's go ahead and hit play. I'm going to left click to attack. And you can see that when our attack is done, the animation returns back to our ground states and loops through player idle. So we have a sword attack. Now it won't do anything. And currently we're able to walk while swinging the sword. Now being able to move while attacking could be a pretty OP way to build your character, but visually, I don't think it makes all that much sense. So we want to lock the player's movement when we're attacking so that we can no longer move. So to do that, let's create a behavior that we can attach to our player attack state machine. So go back to base layer, double click on ground attack, and let's add it to the sub state machine, not to individual attacks. You could add it to every single attack if you want, but if we add it at the state machine level, then while we're in any of these attack states, it's gonna lock our movement. If we add it at the individual uh, animations, then we can lock it on a one by one basis. So it should be relatively easy to adapt to your specific needs. So let's go ahead and create our behavior. So what I want this behavior to do specifically is to set a Boolean on our animator, which we can also reference from our other scripts. And we'll check to see if the player's movement has been locked due to the state machine. So we can create a more generic script for this than saying something like lock player movement. So I'm going to want to click add behavior, make sure that player attack one is not selected and then choose set Boolean behavior. So we'll use this to set true false values on our animator parameters when we're inside a state machine, or you could also use it when you're inside a specific state. So new script, create an add, and let's go ahead and open it up for editing. So being that these are special scripts, state machine behaviors, I'm going to right click in the scripts folder and create a new folder. I'm just going to call this state machine to organize all of our state machine behavior scripts. And I'll drag set pool behavior into it. So you can see there's a bunch of commented out methods for this class. And these allow you to change different parts of your game object or animator at the points in time that are relevant to the animation switching. So so down here at the bottom, what we want is on state machine enter or on state machine exit. That's going to refer to any time we come in here to the ground attack state machine or any time we leave it. So you could also attach it at the base layer for enter or exit if you wanted to, but we want it nested down one level. So only when we're doing a ground attack are we going to use the set bool behavior. So we want to uncomment override public void on state machine enter and on state machine exit. If you wanted to adjust something on individual states, then you can use on state enter or on state exit instead. That would be referring to something like player attack one here. So inside of these functions, you can see we can get the animator component as the parameter, which makes it really easy to set a Boolean value. So we can just do animator dot set Boolean, and then we need the name of the Booleans. So let's do animation strings dot, I'll just call it can move. And then we need a true false value. So I could call this value on enter and then animator dot set bool animation strings. So in on state machine enter, we can use the animator component to set a value pretty easily. So animator dot, let's say set Boolean, and we're going to need a Boolean name to set. So I'll just put in bool name here. And then the Boolean value, we can say value on enter. 
And then we'll have something very similar on exit. So animator.set bool, bool name, value on exit. So let's create those parameters up at the top. So public string bool name, and then we'll have public bool value on enter, value on exit. I also want one more Boolean here, which I'm going to call update on state machine. So if I take this value down here and let's do if update on state machine. So do that for both the on state machine enter and on state machine exit. Then these Booleans are only going to change if we're actually updating on state machine. So you might see why I'm going with this. We can actually use the same script for both on state enter and on state exit as well by just kind of duplicating the code. So let's uncomment up here. I'll leave on state update commented out because I don't want to change anything on every single frame that the animation is updating. We only care about on enter and on exit. So update on state, not state machine. Then we'll do something. And likewise, on state exit as well. So let's do value here, value here. So just copy and pasting those up there. We can put in public bool update on state up here. So everything will default to false, which means nothing's going to happen until we set up our custom values on the inspector of the state machine. But we can take this behavior and we can use it basically anywhere across our animators now that we need to set a specific Boolean parameter, um, whether that's going to be the can move variable like we're going to set up now or something else entirely. So coming out back here to the state machine, you can see our script up here. So I'm going to put can move for the Boolean name, and I'm going to add a new Boolean called can move here. So this is the parameter we're going to set. We want to set it when we enter the state machine, not the state. So I'm going to check update on state machine. The value on state machine we want is that it's going to be false. And on exit, we want it to be true. So let's also check can move to be true so that when our character starts moving at the start of the script, we can move until we enter something like the ground attack state, we don't want to disable the player's movement. So let's take this string and add it to animation string so we can use it across all of our regular scripts. So I'm going to copy paste can move. Let's go into animation strings, internal static string, can move equals, and we'll do can move. Now we want to check this value on the animator controller for our player controller. So let's use another property to do that. This property will only reference whatever value is set on the animator controller. So let's do public boolean can move, we'll have a get, and that's going to return animator dot get bool, and we'll do animation strings dot can move, and that's all we need there. So what we want to do now that we have access to whether the player is allowed to move or not is we want to limit our movement. So we can lock our movement in a couple places, uh, one of which is going to be our current move speed. Then what we can do is we take all of this and wrap it in a if can move. So if can move, then we'll do all of this. Otherwise, I want another return zero. So we'll say movement locked as the comment. Now, another place I might want to do this is down here for jump. So down here on jump, we're already checking for the jump button to be pressed. And if we're on the ground, but we might also want to prevent the player from being able to jump if we're in a state where it's impossible to move. So I'll do and and can move here as well, just as another check. So we want to make sure that we're able to move before we allow the player to jump. I think that just makes sense. You can adjust things how you want for your final controller. So now let's go back out to our main scene, click on the player so that we can watch the parameters. I'm going to hit play. You can see that can move is set to true by default. Whatever we're doing, jumping, walking around on the wall, can move is still true. But if we press left click, can move is set to false. So if I swing my sword and try to move, you can see that can move prevents me from being able to move because we're using that parameter inside of our player controller script. So now a player that is attacking cannot move. And as we add player attack two, player attack three, that will also apply. So we have our basic attack animation set up properly and we limited our player from being able to move while it's attacking.